if the big title on your screen wasn't uh, enough to tell you, this is Optimizing Queries with Explain. I am Sherry Cabral. I'm a data senior database administrator here, as the title says. You can find me on Twitter at that handle. And for those of you who have seen the indexing talk that I gave last week, this is a compliment to it. It is not does not cover a lot of the same information. I think I have one slide on cardinality, and that's it, with the overlap, and it's a very good complement to it. So with that, let's uh, let's get started. What is Explain? Explain is an SQL extension. Um, in fact, they just released a new SQL standard to the 2016 ISO standard. Uh, still not in there. Um, so it's SQL, but it's MySQL's uh, deviation from SQL. How do you use it? You just put it at the beginning of your statement. That's it. So if you want select count star for MySQL user, you want to know a little bit about it, you put explain in front of it. You could also use desk or describe. So you could say describe select count star for MySQL user or desk if you really want. And it used to be that you could only use it with select statements. That was for 5.5 and lower. So you may have to change your updates or deletes or inserts into a select to do an explain if you're on 5.5 five or lower. So yeah, and in 5.6 and higher, you could do it for select, insert, update, delete, and replace. So it's very exciting. Explain shows a lot of information. Um, here's a lot of information. That is me in my light-up skirt. I have a friend who does light painting photography, and so this was all done live, no Photoshop, no kind of after effects. Anyway, so here's what you're going to learn uh, in this talk and what Explain shows you. It shows you the number and the name of the tables or views that are used. It shows you how those tables are joined. It shows you how the data are looked up. It shows you subqueries, unions, and sorts, wh if they are in the query and or optimization path. Um, it shows you if you're using where or distinct. Uh, it shows you the indexes it thought about. It shows you the indexes it actually used. It shows you the length of those indexes. Um, that's very important because if you have a compound index, which is more than one field in the index, it may only be using the first part. And you may want to know that because you're like, why is it's using the index? Why isn't it doing the right thing? Why does it still have to sort? Well, because it's not actually using the second half of the index. The approximate number of rows it thinks it's going to look at that's important because of metadata. We talked a lot about metadata last week and why the metadata and um, statistics that it MySQL have may not match reality and more. So let's dive right in. Metadata. Uh, to choose an index, the MySQL opti optimizer uses metadata. We talked a little about cardinality last week in the talk, but the cardinality is the number of elements in a set. The lower number of cardinality you have, the more duplicates you have. So for example, a yes-no field has a cardinality of 2. A unique field that has 100 rows populated has a cardinality of 100. So total number of rows, does it use an index, does it use a full table scan? You know, that's important. EnoDB has approximate statistics, and everyone should be using EnoDB. Analyze table does a few dives into the data. It's about 8. But it's configurable by different variables in different versions. And these are the Oracle variables. So they're in Percona, they're in Oracle, they're in everything. Um, and these dives are fast, um, but they're not accurate. An optimized table is more slow. Uh, it does also locks, but it's a lot more accurate because uh, it rebuilds the whole index. Let's take a look at explain output. Now, this query comes from the Sakila sample data set, which is, um, it kind of shows its age. The data set is from a video rental store, which do not exist anymore. But I think that you don't need to know how that works to understand these examples. So we have a table called rental. We have a query that's select return date from rental, where rental ID equals 13534. Now you might look at this. You might say there's a table called rental, and there's a field called rental ID, and I think that's an auto increment primary key. And you'd be right. So. Here's what, here's what it looks like, and we're going to go through all of this and see what it means. So the ID is 1. The ID is just a sequential identifier. It's 1 per table, 1 per subquery, 1 per derived table that you're using. And views are virtual. They don't actually return any rows. So if you had a view in here, if rental was a view, it wouldn't return the row. But you would see one row for each table, subquery derived table, in the view definition. So that can kind of mess you up, too, if you're looking for stuff and you're like, why are there three tables when I only 
selected from one, while that one table might be a view. So select type is the second one. This says simple. We like simple. This field tells you if the table is used in a subquery union or it will just say simple. So most of the time it's going to say simple because uh, a union, by the way, is different from a join. A union is when you take a bunch of different queries and put them together as opposed to a join, which is putting tables together. So primary, if it says primary, it means the table is the outermost table in a union or subquery. If it says union or subquery, it means that the table is the second or later in either a union or a subquery, whichever one it, it says. If it says dependent union or dependent subquery, it's the second or later in a dependent union or dependent subquery, and it's dependent on the outer query. So dependent subqueries and dependent unions are bad because they are reevaluated once for unique variables in the outer query. So anytime you have a unique variable in the outer query, um, it's not so great. Union result is the final row of an explain in a union. Derived is a subquery and from, from clause. Um, uncacheable query or union is a subquery. Even if it's a union, it's actually a subquery in the union. If it says uncacheable union, it is a subquery that's reevaluated for every single outer row. So it's wor much worse than the dependent subquery because it's the dependent subquery is for unique variables in the outer query. Let's say you have an outer query um, that has an ID that matches several things in the inner query. All right, so maybe you're matching first names and last names, and you've got John in the first name, and you want to match all the last names, and that happens to be your dependent subquery. Um, it's only going to reevaluate it once for John, and once for Mark, and once for whatever. Whereas uncacheable will be like, oh, John Smith, that it, it keeps um, reevaluating John, the outer query. And then it, for John Jones, it will, re, it will still reevaluate it. Dependent is better than uncacheable. Look for small rows examined and return. A join is best if possible. So if you see some of these things, one of the ways that you can optimize it is, can I turn this into a join instead of a dependent subquery or an uncacheable subquery or an uncacheable union? So this is what a union looks like. We are explaining uh, select first name from staff, union select first name from customer. This will give you a whole bunch of first names. And if the first names are duplicates, it, it will actually go through and remove the duplicates. And you could say union all instead of union if you want to have all the results. So here's what it looks like. Uh, the select type is primary um, when the ID is one. That's the first table for staff. You can see the next, spoiler alert, <laughs> the next field called table is what's which table it is. Um, and then the second row says union, and the table under that is customer. And then the third one says select type of union result. And the table isn't a real table. It's the union of one and two. So that's what a union looks like. Not many people use unions. As I s just said, the table is the table name. So explain select return date from rental, where rental ID equals 13534. The table name is rental. This may not seem like a big deal of a field, but it super, super is. If no table is used, it's null, and we'll talk about what that might be. Like if you do explain select one plus one, there's no table. You know, from dual, there's no table. Um, and null if the query is impossible. So for example, if you do a s an explain select return date from rental where rental ID equals zero, um, MySQL uses its metadata and it says, I know the first rental ID is one, so I'm just not even going to bother going to the table at all because I know I'm going to return nothing. The query is impossible. And so I just answer that question, why is that query impossible, and how does the optimizer know? And that was pretty much the subject of last week's talk uh, with the B trees and everything and the metadata. Now, aliases dominate this field. So if I did something like select, explain selects from rental as R, it would show the table as R. And that's why this field is so important, because if you use the aliases and all of a sudden you have your explain has five table joins and you've got like R and C and Q and R2 and you're like, I don't even know what these tables are anymore. Reconsider using aliases if you're using them. So here's, uh, here's something, right? Uh, the same union. Staff has S, union select, first name from customer. You can see you've got a table S and a table customer. It gets kind of annoying when you have a really long explain result. I don't know if you all noticed, but this format does not look like the output of a normal MySQL query when you end it with semicolon. And this is ended with backslash G, actually backslash capital G, means show me the results in a vertical format. Um, if you really care, backslash lowercase g shows that in the normal horizontal format. It's the same as semicolon. But just for people who like completion, yes, you know, 
capital G and small g are inverses of each other. So if you learn nothing else, you've learned that backslash capital G is uh, vertical output. All right, let's talk about partitions. So which partitions serve the matching records? Um, oh, and of course, it's also only if explained partitions is used. Why it shows up if you don't use explained partitions, I don't know. But there you go. So if I really wanted to know the partitions, I would have to say explain partitions, select return date from rental. And it's null, also null for non-partition tables. Type. This is the big one. Type is <laughs> one of the fun entries. It shows the, what's called the data access strategy. And what is that? That's the strategy for accessing the data. It's how we're going to get there. So this is what you want to get as good as possible. And uh, just for fun, I'm going to do this list in terms of worst to best. Most lists that you'll see do it in terms of best to worst. But I find this is easier to explain. So the worst data access strategy. Does anyone know? Anyone want just want to shout it out? Table scan. Great. Five points to Gryffindor. Full table scan. It's, it's called all. It does not use an index. So this is number 12 of 12. This is the worst one. There's 12 different data access strategies. That's why this is a fun section, because we go through a lot of explanation on, on all this. So if it says all, that means it does a full table scan, and it doesn't use an index at all. And you only want to see this if you have like a really small table. Like maybe you have a table of the list of the countries in the world. So there's 200 some odd of those, right? You don't want a million row table that's doing a full table scan. I mean, maybe you do if you're actually getting all the data from the entire table. But for the most part, this is bad. So it might be okay if there's very few rows in the table. The next one is an index, which does a full index scan which is only slightly worse than a full table scan. But if you need to get all the rows, this is the way to do it. Um, so if you must scan all the data, consider getting a covering index, especially if you have large text fields or whatever, because doing a full index scan will in fact be faster than doing a full table scan, usually. Depends on what other fields are there. So if you do have to scan all the data periodically, consider using a covering index. And a covering index is a name for um, an index that covers everything in a query that you're going to use. The next uh, data access strategy is range. It does a partial index scan, right? Remember our B trees? It's just going to take a portion of that. So this is number 10, right? These numbers are, are worst to best. Number one is the best. Um, and actually, I think zero is the best, but we'll get there. Um, so this is if you're using less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, right? Like, it's hard to get better than that if you're using ranges. This is what you get. If you have a range and it's doing a full index scan, then you go back to that indexing talk that we did last week to say, why isn't it using a partial index scan? Why is it doing a full index scan? And maybe it's doing too much data. Oh, also for is null, between, and in. Now, between is just greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. Um, in is a bunch of or statements that it might do. Um, and then some or statements whose parts use the same index, right? That's very important because it's doing an index scan of one index. And I'm, I have my index finger out here to say one, which you can't see. But it's very important it's a one index because there is a way to get more than one index, which we will see pretty soon. Here is a range query. Select rental ID from rental where the rental date, which is a date time, is between... Uh, you could see where I got some of this data from, right? This data is super old. Uh, February 14th, 2006, uh, midnight and 11.59.59 p.m. So it's a type of range. It's going to do this range query. Who knows what data access strategy we used for this and why? Could be range, could be something else. Full table scan. Excellent, excellent. Five points to Hufflepuff. It's actually a full index scan, but uh, because there is, you didn't, know, you don't know the structure of this table. There is an index on that, because you're doing this date rental date. You're doing a function on the index, and MySQL does not have functional indexes. You may come across stuff where you're like, hey, this should be doing, you know, a range scan because I'm just doing that one date, and I know there's tons of data. Why is it doing an index? It literally has to go through each item in the index, run that function on the index, and then do it. Now, the cool part is a lot of the times you can change the other side of the query, not the, not, you can, you know, like when you have an equation, you know, like x plus 1, and then you can move it to y minus 1 to the other side. A lot of times you can do that here, right? So instead of date, rental date, you can change it to rental date between, like we had in this query on the last slide, right? 
Um, if you have X plus one equals two, which you literally can do where, you know, rental date plus one equals whatever, um, you can say whatever minus one. So there are some sometimes ways that you can kind of uncast and, and take out the function. Data access strategies, index subquery. So here's where we get into some interesting ones. This is a subquery using a non-unique index of one table. So if you have a subquery on a table and there's something like a date, right, which might have more than one value for the same date, that might use it. Unique subquery is very similar. It's a subquery using a unique index of one table, right? So they kind of go together. That's why they're on this slide. Index merge. This is, we're getting number seven. We're getting, getting to the halfway point. Index merge is when it uses more than one index. It's merging two or more indexes together. This is not used with full text indexes. Not a problem since we don't use full text indexes, but I figured I'd just throw that out there. The extra field will show you more information. The extra field is way at the bottom of the explain. Um, and it will show you what kind of algorithm it used to do this index merge, whether it's an intersection, a union, or a sort union. Uh, personally, I don't look at it that much. I think it's interesting to have that information, but I've never sat there like, well, it shouldn't be a sort union. It should be a union. And there, you can look at the index merge optimization in, my, in the MySQL manual for more information. This is used with some OR queries. And I will say that it used to be that in the past, if you saw index merge, that was definitely bad because it means that you could have a, a new index that uses everything. Index merge has gotten a little better in future versions of MySQL, so this may not kind of be a death sentence. For now, we still kind of treat it as if we see index merge, like, is there a better index we could use? If there's an index on one field and an index on another field, maybe we can combine those indexes. So we still try to do that. The big problem when you're optimizing a whole bunch of queries is that you can create an index, you know, you can create a set of indexes for each query that will work for each query, but then all your writes will be slow. So there's an art to being like, well, how frequent is this query? How, how much better is it going to get versus the overhead it's going to add? Rental, the rental table has indexes on customer ID and rental date. We knew it had it on rental date because we saw the range. I uh, did a full index scan before. So this will show us that we're getting the return date from rental where the rental date is between these two things or the customer ID is five. Right? I don't know why you would specifically do this, but this particular query, but it's an example. Um, so this doesn't index merge, and it actually says the possible keys are the rental date and the customer ID foreign key, which makes sense. And then the actual keys used are both. And you can see the key length says 5, 2. That's pretty interesting, too, because you're, you know it's using 5, which is actually the length of a date, and 2 um, on the customer ID. Now, if either of these were a compound index, you would know it's only using the first part of the compound index. Um, because if it was something like the rental date had the rental date and you know something else as part of it, you would see it be larger than 5 if it used both parts. And then you can see the extra here down here says using sort union on these two fields. So that's how it's combining them. Using where literally just means it has a where clause. That's just another part of extra that we'll get to later. Um, and that's important because if you don't have that, that means you didn't filter anything out. Um, you just selected the whole table. So you probably will see using where in almost every query unless it's a in full index scan or a full table scan. But what if there was an index that had both? What if we had an index on customer ID or rental date? Then it would be much better, right? So that's that's kind of where you start to look at it, and you're like, well, we need an index on customer ID. We also need an index on rental date. And in the indexing talk, I talked about how you could have a, two indexes, one on customer ID and rental date, and one on just rental date. And then you've kind of got all the scenarios covered by indexes. Number six, halfway through, ref or null. This is where it gets starts to get a little tricky with a ref. This is when you're joining or looking up non-unique index values, right? So if we're joining the customer table, it's a non-unique index on the rental table. The join can use either a key prefix, so it can use part of the key, or a non-unique index. And we'll see that there is a different one for if it's using a unique index, but that's faster if there's unique index. Because once you hit the match, you know you can stop because you've already, you know, that you know that's unique. With a non-unique index, you have to look through at all the values to make sure that you've gotten all of the possible uh, rows that you can get. 
So indexed fields can be compared with equals, not equals, or the null safe equality. And if the fields involved are defined as nullable, an extra pass is done to search for null values, even if there are no, no null values. If the fields involved are defined as nullable, if the definition says null as opposed to not null, then it's going to do an extra pass, period, end of story, even if there are no null values. So we talked about this in the last talk too, but try not to use null if you don't have to. So try to use not null as default. Not null is your friend. Not null is my friend. This is what a full text index looks like. So you would actually use this where match against whatever. So the storm there, the against is the text you want to match, and the match is the fields that you have. The type just says full text. We talked in the other talk about you know what, what the full text indexes look like and how to optimize them. This is just what it looks like. It says full text and says you know here title description. It's what it used. Notice how the key length is zero. That's interesting. And that's because it's using kind of a separate internal table to match the keywords. So it doesn't really have a length. So let's talk about ref number four. It's like ref or null, but without that extra pass to look for a null value. So it's pretty interesting that ref or null is six. Between having null and not having null is full text. So that's how much of an improvement you're getting is that there's even a different kind of data access strategy in the middle there. Preferably, we wouldn't have that extra pass to look for null values. So if you get a query and your query comes back with a type of ref, that's pretty good, right? This is number four. Um, and this is for joining or looking up non-unique index values. Uh, the join can use a pre key prefix or a non-unique index. Indexed fields are compared with equals, not equals, or null safe equals. So this is just like ref or null, but without that extra null pass. This strategy, and this is important, this is the best you can get unless you're using a primary or unique index. So if you're not using anything unique or primary, and that's on this table. Remember, you get a different row and explain for each table. So I'm not saying if your query doesn't use a primary unique index. I'm saying if this table, right? So if we're joining the rental and customer table, uh, the rental table has a non-unique index on the customer ID. Even though the customer table has unique index, you know, if you look at the data access strategy for the rental table and it says ref, that's the best you can get. So that's pretty awesome. I mean, you may still tweak around which indexes you want to use, but that's where we are. Which data access strategies would we use here? We've got two tables, so there's going to be two. There's no where clause. That's the first thing I note. So this is going to be a full scan on customer and then join to payment, or would you do a full scan on payment and join to customer? Okay, customer. Let's see what it does. So, oh, remember how I said how aliases were a pain in the butt? <laughs> What's row one? Oh, C. Oh, that must be customer. Okay. So you're right. It's doing a full table scan on customer. And you can see it says rows 599. Spoiler alert. That's how many rows it thinks it needs to look at. And then here you've got this. So this, it does a full table scan on one of them and then does a ref on the other because customer may have more than one payment in the payment table. So the customer ID in the payment table is a non-unique index. And that makes sense, by the way, because hopefully you have more payments than you have customers, right? Hopefully each customer is giving you at least one payment, and hopefully you have uh, customers. You don't have any customers with no payments. So preferably, when you, whenever you see this, right, hopefully the customers would be less than the payments, and so you do a full table scan of the customers and then join it to the payments. So the question is, is it doing a Cartesian join and thus doing 599 times 26? No, and that is a Cartesian join is when every row in customer would be joined with every other row in payment. So you would have a customer who is joined to a payment that they didn't even pay. And the reason for that is this using clause. So we call this a join clause. That actually is equivalent to on c.customerid equals p.customerid. When the fields are named the same, you can use this shorthand of using. Um, and so there is a filter but it's filtering on the join. There's no filtering on the rest of it. So this will ensure that each customer will be joined with only their rows in the payment table, so it is not a Cartesian join. 
That is a great question, though, because MySQL doesn't matter if you write inner or cross or nothing. MySQL will do either an inner join or a, Cartes or a cross product, which is called a Cartesian join, depending on what you put in your join or where clause. So you could say inner join payment and without this using clause, and it would do a Cartesian join. EQ ref number three. This is like ref, but on unique index values. And remember, if you have a nullable field that's unique, it can have one and exactly one null value. So it doesn't need to do that extra pass. Joining on unique index values. So that's when you have a join, but the uh, index values are unique. The join can either use a key prefix or unique index. And this is for index fields compared with equals, right? So before we had null safe equals or not equals. That's not going to be an EQ ref. If you have an equality, you might be able to get it down to an EQ ref if, you, if that table is using a unique or primary key. This is pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. If I tell you that we've got two tables here, customer and payment, we have a non-unique index on rental ID and customer ID and a unique index on customer ID. What is it going to use? Customer ID, okay, on both of them. So that's the index it's going to use. So for the payment table, you think it's going to use the P customer ID? And then for the customer table, you think it's going to use the unique C dot customer ID. And then what is the data access strategy? Would it be full table scan? Will it be EQ ref? Would it be, oh, and these are non nullable. Would it be ref? What would it be? Sure, now remember you have a different data access strategy for each table. So if you think it's EQ ref, is it EQ ref on customer or payment? Right, C dot customer ID. So it would be customer, which makes sense. Customer ID is unique to the customer table. So then what so you think that it would be EQ ref on the customer table. What do you think it would be on the payment then? Let's take a look and find out. The beauty of MySQL is that it doesn't uh, play these games and just gives you the output when you hit return. So here's what we've got. We've got type ref for the payments table, and for C, we've got EQ ref. And you're absolutely correct. The possible key that it used and the key that it actually used is the primary key, which is customer ID here. Now here it looked on two different ones. It looked on the customer ID and the payment rental key. And it actually looked at the re payment rental key, uh, which has to do with where rental ID equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Because in payments, right, it only had to look at one row for this rental ID. Rental ID, um, it's not a unique key on payments, but it is very small, right? It's each video, right? Each item that you're renting out has a rental ID. That is actually a better index to use than the customer because a customer may, you know, it, it really depends, right? If it's a popular item to be taken out, then you might have a lot of people taking it out. This is where we're starting to get into the uh, average value groups that we talked about in the indexing talk. So this is a place where you might say, well, why isn't it using the customer ID? Why is it using the payment rental? I mean, the answer here is in rows. It only has to look at, it thinks it only has to look at one row to get what it needs. But wait, there's more. Two is const. Uses a primary unique key, but will re return at most one value. Um, so this is where it knows, oh, once I find a value, I can stop because I got it. This is a, this is a primary key. Once it matches, there's nothing else in the table going to match. I can stop. So you have something like return date from rental as R, where rental ID, right? This is on the rental table. Rental ID is the primary key. Once it finds that, it, it can stop. It knows it doesn't need to go any further. Um, it can also be constant propagation, which is pretty cool. Constant propagation is when you, um, when you have a table that joins with another table, um, and if we joined in the last example on customer ID, it would have done constant propagation because it would have known as soon as the join happens, like, okay, I've got four different customer IDs, one, two, three, and four, it will then do the join. It'll be like, okay, I'm only looking for one, two, three, and four. Those are my constants. I might have an example of that uh, coming up. So system is very similar with con for to const, but the table only has one row. It's uh, called a system table. And then there's null, which is the zeroth one, which there is no data to access. So it's the same as the table is null. If there's no data to access, then it's super fast. Um, and the optimizer may access metadata, so you might see something like uh, optimized, you know, away tables from where clause or something. Whoa, so here is the list 
from fastest to slowest. So this is where you'll kind of see it. So you system is the best, then const, then eq ref, then ref, then full text, all the way down to the full table scan. So this is your cheat sheet. This is what you take a picture of, right? This is what the MySQL manual for explain will have. So you don't have to memorize this. I certainly don't. I look at the manual page every time. And there you go. So this is the rest of the explain output. Possible keys. We've already talked about some of this. The possible keys are primary in this one because it thinks, oh, I might be able to use the primary key. And guess what? It's right. So if MySQL didn't consider the index you think it should, there's usually a reason, as we talked about in the indexing talk. Um, maybe it's about sorting, right? Maybe it needed to sort, so it used a different index. The order of the index itself, other filters on it, right? Like we thought, was it going to use customer ID or rental ID, right? There was a filter on rental ID, and that filter was a tighter filter, so it used that first. The size of the data, amount of data searched, if it's over about 15%. Again, we talked about this in the other talk. So if you have something like amount of data search, so I'll explain select star from rental, we're a rental date between June 1st and July 6th. Here it does a range search, and you could say it's about 2338 rows is what it thinks it's going to search. The type is range, and the question is at what point does the data get so much faster that it's going to do a full table scan? It's faster to do the full table scan, and the answer is uh, one month and seven days. So if we do the query between June 1st and July 7th, then it does a full table scan. The interesting thing to note is it's filtered 17.69%. That means it thinks that about 17.69% of the data is what it's going to use. Whereas when it used a range scan, it did it's going to use 100% of the rows it searches. When you do a range scan, it knows it's using a B-tree index. It's going to start at the bottom of the range. It's going to start at June 1st. It's going to end at July 6th, and it's going to use all the data it finds. Whereas when it does a full scan with 16,000 rows instead of 2,800 rows, right, 2,800, um, it thinks it's only going to use about 17.69% of the data. But again, that's where you get that 15% is about right. It doesn't even try to use a key. You can see it does say using where. So this is uh, live in action, the too much data problem, quote unquote. So who remembers this query and explain plan? Right, so we have possible keys as null. That's a big red flag. If you have possible keys as null, that's huge, right? Even though the key it says it used rental date, then you may be like, well, it's you know, if you if you're kind of not really paying attention, like index, well, it's using an index that's great. Um, this is using an index, a uh, full index scan. So this possible keys as null is a big red flag if you see that in your explain. That's not like MySQL's weird. Like it didn't have any possible keys, and then it ended up using a key. Right? That sounds weird to say, but that's exactly what happened. MySQL is like, I can't use any indexes for that, so I guess I'll do a full index scan and use the rental date index. So if you see possibly keys null, big red flag. So key and key length is the key it used and then the length of the key that it used. Longer keys take a longer time to traverse and compare. A key length shorter than the length of the key shows that only part of the key was used. So again, in that, why isn't it doing what I think it's doing? Check your key length. It could be an index prefix. Um, it could be one part of a compound index. So ref, explain select return date from rental, where rental ID equals 13534. That should be pretty easy. So ref is not ref as the data strategy ref. It's the reference. It's the next thing after key length. So it's which column or const for number is compared using the index from key. So this is using the primary key, and the ref here is the constant. It's 13534. Um, and you'll see that in constant propagation. You'll see that the ref will be a column. It'll say, like, oh, customer ID. So I'm going to keep coming back to this because it's a really good query for seeing a lot of stuff. Uh, the ref here is null. And again, a big clue that the optimizer has no value to compare to the index, and that's why it does a full index scan. So possible keys null is a big red flag. Ref null is a big red flag. Ref null literally means I can't compare it to anything. And it's not comparing it to anything because it's doing a full index scan. Big red flags. So rows and filtered, uh, we talked about this a little bit. Rows is how many rows the optimizer believes it needs to scan. And this is what this whole talk last week was about with the whole average value group size and too much metadata. Um, the metadata is really important. 
So if you see the rows and it's vastly different from what you think it might be, then think about the stuff we talked about in the indexing talk. Now, what if you have a limit? Limit actually changes the rows that are examined, but explain still shows as if there's no limit because it doesn't really know where in the search you're going to find that limit. Um, so if you say, you know, select star from foo limit 100, um, it doesn't know if that 100 is going to be, is, you know, the end of the data or whatever, right, especially if you're doing sorting and ordering by. Um, and filtered is the percentage of rows that it thinks will be returned, right? So 100 is great. Um, 100 means it's going to use everything it looked at. Um, this is where you get into cardinality discussions, right, where if you have an index, you want to use the highest cardinality at the front of the index because then you're going to return more of the rows or you're going to actually use. So here's another example of filtered. Uh, this does a full table scan, so return date between these two. Because we're doing a select star, it's doing a full table scan. It could use an index if we weren't selecting every field, but there's no point in using an index. So it does think it's going to return about 1,600 records from the 16,000. Uh, you know, that's a approximate 11%. Um, and of course, if you see something like this where it's like all null, 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 right? These are red flags. There's no possible key it could use. There's no actual key it could use. There's no reference it could use, right? It just did a full table scan. So it knows from its metadata that if I'm looking for in that kind of a time range, in that time range of a day, you know, the data set is such that if it's about, there were probably 10 days of data in there. The interesting thing about index cardinality is that you can find it in the statistics table. So see this from information schema dot statistics where table name is table schema is Sequila, so that's the, the Sequila sample schema, and table name is rental. So what are we selecting? We're selecting the index name, the sequence in the index, the column name, and the cardinality. So this is all that stuff for all of the indexes on the rental table. The primary key has one thing in it. It's called rental ID. There's a rental date key that has three parts to it. There's an inventory ID, customer ID, and staff ID, which each have one part to it. You could order it by cardinality if you wanted to see the cardinality of different things, right? So the primary key has the highest cardinality. The rental date has a pretty high cardinality, which means this is a pretty bad data set to use because it has such a high cardinality. Whereas inventory ID, it's kind of split, right? It's 4580, so there's about 4,000 different, right? It's about 25% of the total rentals. So that's kind of what you would expect for items that you rent out. Um, there's only 600 customers, you know. So this is the kind of stuff that we look at. We can look at the cardinality as opposed to trying to do a, a count and a group by. We can look at this to see the cardinality. And again, this is going to be approximate based on the data dives in, Eno D in EnoDB. So uh, extra is theoretically the last row um, that you see. Um, so we saw using where. Uh, we saw a bunch of different things. Extra can be good or bad. It depends. It's often self-explanatory, like using where means it's using a where clause. So it's filtering stuff out. If you don't have using where, make sure that's what you want to do. Uh, using index. I'm not going to go through every single thing that could possibly come up and go through the major ones. So this is using index means it's a covering index. So it's not quite as obvious as using where. It's not like, oh, it uses an index. That's not what it means. What it means is it's a covering index. It never has to go to the underlying data. Using file sort has nothing to do with files. It uses the file sort algorithm to do an extra pass through the data for sorting. It may also need to use the file system to copy a temporary table to disk if it gets too big. But um, this isn't necessarily a death sentence. Some people look and they're like, oh my god, files. It takes so much long, you know, so much more I.O. and that's why. No, it's just using a file sort algorithm to sort. Now, if you see this, you might be able to say, well, is there a different index that we can use to do the sorting for you? Maybe we could put something at the end of, you know, the index it's already using to put it in the right sorting order. Distinct not exists. Um, so distinct is one possible value and extra. Not exists is another one. Both of them mean it stops at the first row match. Because again, if you have a distinct value and it matches a row, then that's fine. You don't need to look at any more because you just wanted the distinct ones. If you have not exist, it stops at the first row match because if it because that means it exists. So it's going to return false on the not exists. It doesn't need to look at the rest of the data. It already knows it exists, so it's already false. Temporary means there's an intermediate temporary table used to store results. There are variables in MySQL that tell you how big a temporary table can be in memory before it gets written to disk. So temporary isn't necessarily a terrible thing. 
because it may or may not be written to disk, but it's something to note, right? Your query is big enough that it has to use an intermediate temporary table to store results. We saw the index merge algorithm rather already, the uh, intersection sort union and union. And all the values for extra, there's like 20 some odd values are in the MySQL manual explain output page. Oh, I thought I linked to it, um, but you can Google search for MySQL manual explain output and you'll find it. This is not in 5.5, it's in 5.7. There is this extension called explain format equals JSON. As a database administrator, I hate JSON, or rather, I love JSON. It's a database, right? It's fully formed, fully structural, right? XML, uh, it's great. I love it. Ha the problem comes when people put JSON into a database because then it's all, yo dog, I heard you like databases, so I put a database in your database. Um, and you get long text objects with 3,000 JSON objects in them um, in MySQL, and it's terrible. But here's where I love JSON. So explain format is JSON. We'll give you the explain output in JSON format, but it's not just that. It gives you more information. Um, I don't know why they put it only in the JSON format and not in the table output, but it's lots more information. So basically always use it once you have it. You can't use it in 5.5 because it doesn't exist. So here's what happens if we do explain format equals JSON on select rental ID from rental. Uh, where the, Again, this is my functional index. I love using this. Here's what it starts to look like. Um, if you know JSON, this is pretty easy for you. Query block, the select ID, right? That's the ID of the row. Cost info, hey, hey, we got a query cost. That's pretty cool, right? So now you can do explains and see the actual query cost and not just try to like add an index and run it and be like, well, it seems faster. You can actually get a query cost in here. No idea why they don't put that in the tabular output at all, but it should be there and it's amazing. And I don't know what this cost is, by the way. I don't know what the units are. Just I do know that lower is faster. And I'm pretty sure in the MySQL manual they say we don't know what this is either, right? Or like you don't have to know what the cost itself is. It's not milliseconds or whatever, nanoseconds. It's just this is the cost. The smaller the cost, the faster it will be. Table, so this is stuff that we know about. Table name, access type, right? This is our data access strategy and the key. Uh, used key parts, right? So this is more than just the length of the key. Um, so this tells us that it's using the whole index, right? All three parts of the index. Um, key length is 10. Uh, rows, so here's where we get rows examined per scan is the same as rows, but then it's rows produced per join, right? So that gives you actually the filtered percent. So examined times filtered equals produced. So if it was 11%, then you would see, you know, 6,000 or 1,600 rows there. Using index is true. So I don't know why they specifically put that in there, right? That would be the explain. It's using a covering index. Still useful to know. And again, the cost info, right? So you've got, here's, here's your cost. Here's what it does. Your data read per join, 502K. Like, that's amazing. Amazing. And then the columns that were used, right? So it's using the rental ID because that's what you're selecting, and it's using the rental date because that's what it's doing the function on to, to compare the value. Yeah, so there is an attach condition where it casts the date, right? So you see that. So explain format equals JSON is what you're going to use in 5.7 because it's amazing. So thank you very much.